So recently, I was invited to the University of Westminster to share my thoughts on being an agent in Prime Central London and to describe my experiences so far. There was a bit of a Q&A session at the end as well. So I'm putting the video here for you guys so that you can hopefully pick up a few interesting and useful things that the students asked me on the day. Just before we get into that, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe for the YouTube algorithm. And if you haven't yet signed up to our new website, bartkhmielewski.com, make sure you go over there and register your interest for all of the exciting things that my team and I are going to be working on behind the scenes, products, events, and everything else that you'll find useful when it comes to property and general sales skills as well. And with that being said, let's get right into it. Awesome. Thank you, Hadi. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a strange uh, experience for me. I'm probably similar age to all of you here. Um, so I was surprised when Hadi reached out for me to speak to you guys. It's um, you know an interesting experience for me. But... Um, I went down a slightly different route um, compared to you. I didn't go to university. Um, I could have gone to university, but an opportunity came up and um, things sort of went from there. So I just wanted to touch on my uh, journey and experiences to date. Hopefully you find it relatively um, insightful and then we'll run through a few case studies, how my day looks like at the moment, selling some of the best properties in London, um, and we'll open it up to a few questions at the end. So... Let's, um, do you have a clicker, by the way, Hadi, so I can click away, or should I do it on the laptop? Okay, let's start with this. Sure. Don't worry, I'll do it like this. So, um, 2021, I was finishing my A-levels, um, did relatively well at school, I was always going to go into finance um, and be a banker or do that sort of thing, but... Um, I decided I didn't really want to be sat behind a desk all day. Property is a very flexible um, thing. We're, we're out and about meeting people, seeing properties all day, every day. Um, so instead, I moved to London. I used to live in Kent, so I'm not from London at all. I moved to, to London to start at Chesterton's, which is a big corporate agency firm selling properties um, across the capital. I managed to do pretty well there. Um, within a year or so, I, I became the highest billing negotiator at the company, so I was doing about a million pounds in revenue. Um, for the company per annum, um, which uh, put me in some pretty good circles. I built a good network and um, started working really hard on my knowledge. I ended up doing about 60 or 70 deals whilst at Chesterton, so the volume of transactions that I was handling was, was pretty high. And I decided that um, I wanted to reinvest some of my money that I was making. So the way it works in agencies is that we, we work on a commission basis so that Basic salaries are really low, between 16 and 25,000 pounds maybe, but then you get a cut of the revenue that you bring in. So it was a really re results-focused um, industry. So I did pretty well, made quite a bit of money there, bought my first property um, in 2023, which I flipped, bought it for around 300 grand, ended up selling it for just under 600, so that's a 50% uplift. But the only reason I was able to do that is because of everything I'd learned in the first few years, because of all of the deals that I did. I knew the pound per square foot ratios. I knew which property to buy on which street, what to do to it to make it attractive to a buyer, and to then sell it as well, um, using the experience over the last sort of two years before that. Once that was out of the way, I had a nice bit of, cap uh, nice bit of cash uh, sort of built up, so I decided, okay, I've got good knowledge. I don't know everything, but enough to go out and do it on my own. So I quit Chesterton's and started Dawson Barker towards the end of last year. Um, and since then, we've been building and... Uh, trying to make something happen. My day-to-day -day now is, is very different than it was two years ago. I'm, I'm sort of focused on high net worth clients, some of the bigger and better transactions in London, and um, it's been good, for, good fun so far. So my typical day is very structured. This is what I try and teach my team um, on a daily basis. You won't be able to see it, but I just wanted to highlight that as an agent, um, you have to have a really good structure. Big, big focus hours in the morning, and um, a lot of hard work. It looks all glamorous. You know, I don't know if any of you watch the TV shows on Netflix, Selling Sunset, whatever. It's not really like that. It can be like that later on down the line when you've got amazing clients and lots of money coming in. But to begin with, it's just a lot of graphs. So it's a lot of phone calls, 50 phone calls every morning, sending out cold emails and uh, working really hard. And you've got to be structured. Without this, you'll never do the deals. This sets up success um, for, for you as an agent. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to touch on a case study. So the mornings, we, we really focus on, on the outbound efforts, so doing the emails, doing the phone calls, doing the boring stuff. And then in the afternoon, 
we're often out with clients doing viewings, valuing properties, um, and away from the desk. So um, just last week on Monday, I had a client that flew in from South Africa. He owns a private equity firm. He wants to move some of his cash into London, so he's got a budget of about six million quid. He was here for three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and over that time period, we sort about 30 properties together, um, which helped educate him as a buyer. Um, you want to take buyers on a bit of a journey so that they know what they're getting themselves into. As an international coming into London, it's very difficult to, to decide what you're going to put five million or six million pounds into without being educated properly. So we try and take our buyers on a really educational journey. We saw pretty much every type of architecture on, on most of the good roads in prime central and central London, also then ventured out in southwest London and Surrey just to give him an idea of price differences relative to the space as well. As you can imagine, for the same money in Cobham, um, you get three times the house than you would in Belgravia. He ended up liking um, this house here on Eaton Terrace, um, and since then we've been talking about uh, putting in an offer. Now, obviously buying something for five or six million quid is a big financial um, decision, so we go through um, all sorts of yields and numbers um, to help us make a decision. The property's on the market for £6,595,000. I'm actually representing the buyer here, so I'm advising him that actually buying it around £6,050,000 is probably the best decision. This is um, the, the spread that we've come up with. Uh, just, to, just to lay out his costs all in and then how that translates into any sort of yield. Um, just to run through the numbers very quickly, if you were to buy it £6,050,000, my commission on that would be, whatever, 150 grand. Stamp duty is 10.5%. He's actually a UK resident from, from a long time ago. But as you can tell, when you're buying a property for six million quid, you're not just paying six million. You're gonna pay commission, you're gonna pay stamp duty, and a lot of other things. So all in costs are actually at 6.83. Um, he thinks in dollars, it's like a more sort of international currency for him. So we've done the, uh, we've done the conversion here, and uh, he's from South Africa, so this is his currency. So um, he can sort of relate to that as well. Um, this property would rent for about £300,000 a year, uh, £6,000 a week. So uh, at a purchase price of £6 million, including all of these costs, the gross yield is about 4.5%, which is really good. Yields in London are usually around 3% on, on super prime assets. So actually this one for 4.56 is, uh, is a good result. And it's only because the property is brand new, it's been renovated recently, and it's actually an unusual layout for an Eaton Terrace house. You've really got to know your stuff as an agent. Eaton Terrace houses are very narrow, very dark. They're sort of iggledy-piggledy and haven't been renovated in 20 years. This is completely different. It's had a massive basement done, big glass that opens out into the garden. So it's going to rent much better than your typical Eaton Terrace house. Now, on the gross rental, um, we would then manage the property for this client and rent it out. My fees for that are around 13%. Um, so we times the gross yield by 87% to figure out his net um, rental yield, which still ends up at about 3.97%. So that's just a quick run through of how I would advise a client um, on, on the number side of a property transaction. And it really is because he's an investor, he's going to buy it to rent it out. When you're selling a property to someone that's going to live in the property and it's a more emotional decision, the conversation is very different. Then you're focusing on you know, things that they like, things that work for their family um, and, and other things. But I think for you guys, especially because I'm assuming you learn about yields and commercial property, this um, is slightly more relevant. Um, so, so far, um, as a company, we've done some pretty good things. Um, 200 million is, is my sort of number. That's how much property I've managed to sell over the last three years. Not under Dawson Barker, but in general. Um, I get to hang out with some pretty interesting people. Um, so for anyone considering being an agent, it's really fulfilling. Um, you know, I'm sort of in the car and on the phone and, and, and meeting with really, really, really successful people every single day, every single afternoon. Everyone um, teaches me as well. My clients are aware of my age. They're aware of my sort of inexperience, I guess, in property. And yet they're very, very, very um, helpful and they take time with me, and they're, they're amazing people. So the guy, Jono, um, that I was showing properties to last week, he's from South Africa, as I said, but he runs a, a massive uh, private equity firm, hugely successful founder, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds um, in terms of his net worth. And I get to hang out with these people because I'm showing them these lovely homes, and I get to learn from them. So that's a huge um, benefit of being an agent. And because I've started my own business, I've been able to build a really nice team as well. 
I've got about six people at the moment. And um, because I run the business, I've sort of bought back my freedom. Being a corporate agent was great, but it was like 12 hours a day, no flex, really, really tough. Running my own business, I'm able to be a bit more nimble, boutique, and uh, make decisions. So, you know, a few weeks ago, we, we flew the team out to the Canary Islands, and we were working remotely and trying the whole remote nomad way of doing things. And it was fun, and I can do that because I run the business. But it took a lot of hard work to be able to do that. So that's a quick rundown of who I am and what I do and what my day looks like. Um, and I just wanted to open it up to you guys, see if you've got any questions, if anyone's interested in a Korean agency or uh, has anything else that they'd like to ask, then I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, <laughs> so the first one. Correct. It's usually a corporate let, so we'll often be uh, approached by a big corporate company like uh, a bank, JP Morgan, that want to place one of their executives in a house in London. So obviously they're multinational companies. You have someone that works in New York and for work purposes has to then move to, to London for, say, two years to work on a project. So JP Morgan will get in touch and they'll say, we've got to place an executive um, in London and I would help find them. Um, you know, £300,000 a year is a lot of money, um, but some of the top executives at, at the banks and at Microsoft and at Facebook make, um, obviously, incredible amounts of money. So that's the sort of profile. I'd say it's a, it's a, it's a corporate, uh, successful executive that would move into a house like that. Yeah. Sorry, um, I know your question, but I thought you asked it in the question. Yes, we're... What's your yeah, internships. Yeah, we, I mean, look, I'm... Uh, yeah, no, it's a good question. We, we would consider that, absolutely. You know, I, I could do with a bit of help, and, and the team are, you know, really great people to be around and, and to learn from, so definitely something to, to sort of look into. I actually, weirdly enough, get applications for internships pretty much every day. Um, because uh, it's, a, it's a really cool job, you know, it's really interesting, there's a lot to learn, so, yeah, definitely something that I've considered, but I haven't done it yet, to be honest with you, so. And do you need a license? No, no, so you don't need a license. Um, obviously, you guys are getting qualified, <coughs> you're getting a degree in real estate, I don't have any property qualifications whatsoever, and yet I'm out advising people on where to park their five million pounds, and so it's pretty weird, but, um, you know, in, in the US, you need a license, everywhere in the world you need a license, but in the UK... No, it's not, not regulated at all. Yeah? How do you deal with competition? Um, you've got to really just put yourself out there. To be honest with you, it comes down to relationships. So whilst I am relatively new and my company is new and my team is new, um, when you really strike a good relationship with someone, they really throw everything else out of the window, if that makes sense. With Jono, we were sat Wednesday afternoon having some wine, you know, talking about things, relating on a lot of things. He's a founder. He founded his private equity firm. I'm a founder. We're sort of bouncing ideas off of each other. And because I was able to build a relationship with him, he then doesn't care, you know, that I've been going around for two or three years. We obviously have a huge strategy behind the scenes as to how we acquire clients and how we do our, our, our business. And, you know, I could talk about that all night, but it really comes down to relationships. You know, when you, when you get on with someone, when you, someone likes you and you like them, great things can happen. You know, that's the main thing. What would you say is your unique selling point? Um, my personal unique selling point, I don't know. I, I just think I, um, I can get on with people, you know. I'm pretty, uh, I, I like to think I'm quite authentic with people. A lot of agents in central London, you know, work for Savills or Knight Frank, and they're sort of trust the fairians, you know, running around, you know, driving mummies Range Rover and trying to be all blah, 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 blah. Um, but I'm, <laughs> I sort of, I, I cut to the chase, I'm, I'm quite direct, you know, I'm, I'm, everything I've done in my life has been off my own back, and a lot of successful entrepreneurs that I work with, and I work with a lot of founders and CEOs, have a similar route um, to where they are that, that I had. Um, whereas, as I say, 90% of agents, first of all, the human, level of human capital in our industry is extremely low, because there's no qualifications, there's no barriers to entry, there's nothing. Um, so when you're able to be quite articulate and, and uh, you know, connect with people, 
it again leads to, to, to really good things. So I just say, I, I think it all comes down to relationships. That's what I would think I'm quite good at. I was a football referee for about five years of all things. And so I dealt with people fucking screaming at me and, you know, giving me a hard time for five years. So now when I'm negotiating with, you know, a managing partner from Citibank and he's screaming at me down the phone with yields and numbers, I'm able to really just lock him back into his place. Whereas I've experienced some of my colleagues um, back down from that sort of thing. But when you're able to give someone the energy that they're giving you back, it, 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 again, it's quite powerful. So, yeah, I, I'd like to think I'm good with people. That's, that's the only thing that I'd say. Nothing, nothing crazy, to be honest with you. Yeah? So development is great, but it's also very uh, challenging and takes a lot of time. So um, that flat I bought uh, in, well, basically the whole thing took about nine months, right? And when you're not making money for nine months, uh, things get tough. So agency is what got me there, and it's what's going to keep giving me money to be able to keep doing that, if that makes sense. So I would have never had known what property to buy, where to buy it, how much to buy it for, how to renovate it, change the floor plan, and then what to sell it for if I hadn't been an agent for two years. No way. I would have got it completely wrong, I would have made no money. Whereas I came out nearly 200 grand clean on that, you know, tax-free, because I did it all in my personal name, I don't know if I should say that. And, um, and it's because I was an agent that I learned all of that, you know. Without being an agent, there's no chance. And you get opportunities thrown at you as an agent. So again, this is completely off-market, the flat that I bought is a probate. I think someone actually died in there. Um, it was completely run down, but I wouldn't have had the call about the property if I wasn't an agent, if I wasn't in the right circle. So being an agent puts you in front of the right people, gives you the right knowledge, and then you can leverage it massively, which is what I did there, and I can do it in other ways as well. I can develop, I can uh, acquire properties, I can run investment funds, I can do lots of things now because I'm an agent. It all comes from being an agent, and you can't do that without building the capital and uh, without having the knowledge as well. So I think... If you get it right, you can be an agent, but you can also develop, you can do everything else at the same time. Yep. What would be the, the main thing that you advise to people that want to start over their own firm or company? Yeah. I would say, and this is contrary to what I believed when I started the business, really, really uh, take time to prove your concept first and look at the numbers very closely. I, when I started my first, well, this business, um, I rented out an office for 20 grand a month, hired about six people, and um, did a lot of things before we even started making money, before we started building revenue. And then it got tight, you know, then it got really tight, and uh, there was a lot of stress. I didn't go to the gym, I didn't take care of myself. I'm like absolutely crazy because of this business, but because I put myself in that situation by overspending, overreaching, and, and not looking at the core principles and fundamentals of running a successful business, which is cash flow at the end of the day. You've got to have money coming in that covers the money coming out. I didn't have the money coming in when I started the business. Um, so I was in a tough spot. So I'd say make money first and then spend it. Don't spend money and then think you're going to make it. But there's, there's a positive of spending money and thinking you're going to make it as well. It's investment, right? But it's got to be calculated, and that wasn't calculated in my office. You know, 20 grand a month, a lot of money. So, yeah, just, just run a really tight cash flow forecast. And if you don't trust yourself with numbers, speak to someone. Hire, put, put together some sort of advisory board, you know? Uh, that's what I should have done. I actually should have called my mum and said, hey, I'm about to take an office out for 20 grand a month. She would have been at my door within five minutes, and, you know. Um, but I didn't. I just acted on my own sort of gut, and it was wrong. So when you're going to make a huge financial decision as a business owner, maybe speak to someone or, um, or, or really, really take time to, to do it. So that was, that's something that I would say for sure. I, do you know what, I just, um, yeah, I had to teach myself. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm massive into reading into things, you know, on Google, Uncle Google. Um, and I just, I just knocked up a, a cash flow forecast by myself and just started playing around with it. Um, it's not something that I was taught at all. Uh, but I did it all too late. I, I didn't know how to run, uh, run a business and make it profitable. I did, you know, I was just sort of a good agent. I could sell properties, I could talk for days, I can build relationships with people, but actually focusing on, on profit and loss and cash flow. and I had no fucking clue, so I had to sit and, uh, and teach myself. Yeah, it wasn't, definitely don't learn that as an agent. No. Yep? You said I was a mentor in your career so far. Have you had someone just to guide you or 
Yeah, I think um, I got very lucky when I first moved to London. My first ever manager, um, Daniel Killick, was uh, hugely influ influential in my life because I came here and I didn't really have any friends. You know, I'm from Kent. All of my mates went to uni all over the world, uh, all over uh, the UK, and so I was by myself. I was trying um, my luck with it with a new industry that I had no idea about, and he kept me very, very calm and focused. He taught me to stick to the process, and that the results would come because we're on a commission based setup, um, things get tight. I was making like a grand a month on, on my salary. My rent was a grand a month, so I was zero net every month for my first six months in London. But he, um, he kept me confident and he kept saying, do you know what, it's gonna come through, it's gonna come through, it's gonna come through. Keep doing X, Y, Z, and it will come through, it will come through. So I really learned that property is a process-based industry, especially agency, that if you follow the process, eventually the um, the results have come through, but I would have never had the peace in my mind if he wasn't such a great, calming uh, mentor for me. If I went straight into central London onto like a trading floor, um, I would have been eaten up and I would have probably crumbled. Um, but uh, having him there just telling me, do you know what, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine, keep doing this, it definitely helps. So I'm very grateful to him for that. And then uh, along the way, you meet lots of inspirational people. I said to you, um, a lot of my clients are very successful entrepreneurs, some are celebrities, and you learn and you pick up things from everyone along the way. Um, but I think initially you've, you've, you've got to find that one person you have some peace with, you trust. Otherwise it gets lonely, you know. I was working 12 hours a day, I didn't go out, didn't drink a drop of alcohol um, and just put my head down and work. So having someone definitely helps, yeah. Yep. How did you find the first one? Um, at Dawson Barker, <sighs> funnily enough, it was, um, I, I, when I developed my flat, um, I used these builders that were recommended to me by my colleague and these builders also renovate lots of properties in the area. So I predominantly operate in Notting Hill, um, do deals all over central London. But he, um, I saw that, uh, that there was a house on the market, it was about £8 million, um, with two of the best agents in Notting Hill. And I knew that he had done some work on the house, so I asked him to introduce me to the owners. He did. One thing led to another, and all of a sudden she fired the other two agents and gave it to me. But it didn't just happen like that, it was weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of following up with her. She's international in Barcelona. She flew in one, uh, on a Sunday and said to me, I can meet you in half an hour. Come and see me. I had to drop everything and go and see her. Um, I pitched to her. We kept talking. I followed up. By the way, by following up, I mean I was sending her messages on WhatsApp. She wouldn't reply. I got the double blue tick. She just wouldn't reply. And I kept going for weeks and weeks and weeks. Eventually, she gave it to me. So it's perseverance. And in property, that's what all it comes down to, just pestering people, to be honest with you. Um, but it's the perseverance that got it to me. But it all started with network and it all started with relationships. If I hadn't had a good relationship with the builder, he wouldn't have made the intro and I wouldn't have had the property. Um, and it's because I was at Chesterton's that I was able to build this network. If I went straight out to starting an agency, no chance. You've got to have some form of um, baseline for what you're doing. You need to be able to know how to do a deal and have some form of network and then start an agency, I would say. Yep. Did you ask how viable it is to flip? Again, it just comes down to the opportunity on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't care if the market's crap or if the market's really good. If you're able to find a good opportunity and, and, and beat the price down, then it makes sense. The, the property that I bought is in Notting Hill. It's on um, probably one of the worst roads in Notting Hill. Um, but uh, it was on for about 420 grand. It's a probate sale, so a very motivated seller. And I ended up buying it close to 300,000 pounds. So I basically got like 100 grand off because I bashed the price into the ground. So then it made sense. Um, there's other things that you look out for when you're buying a development in prime central London. The first floor and the ground floor are the best floors to buy on because you have really high ceilings and it's easy to get in. Once you're on the third or fourth floor and there's no lift, people don't like that. And in the basement, it's really dark, dingy starts getting damp, so people don't like that either. So the best floors to buy on are the ground floor and first floor. This flat was on the first floor, so that was a big tick for me. I knew that in terms of resale, um, it would then be easier to sell it. That's what you have to look at when you're developing properties. What can we shift the quickest? So I bought a first floor flat. At the front, there's two windows, and it was split into two tiny bedrooms. Um, and then at the back, uh, you had the kitchen, bathroom, and like a weird walk-through living room. So I knocked the wall down in the middle of the two windows and made that open-plan kitchen reception. Um, and then at the back, I put the bedrooms in the rooms that had the kitchen and the reception. So I completely flipped the floor plan because people prefer 
the open plan concept. People prefer the, the two big, lovely windows, like a French type vibe. Um, and to have the bedrooms at the back, away from the road, is also better for noise and things like that. So these are all things I was considering whilst doing it. Uh, but I had to buy it extremely well. Then I had to spend a lot of money renovating it, staging it, marketing it properly, and then really drive the sale as well. I achieved a record pound per square foot ratio for the, uh, for the flat. Flats on Latimer Road usually sell for 900 pounds per square foot max. I sold mine for just under 1,300 a foot, so I had to break a record to, to make money. But it's because I knew the process, because I worked with lots of lots of developers over these last years that did exactly what I then did, and I learned from them. Um, so it's viable, but you've got to know your stuff. Um, and I only knew my stuff because I did that. Yeah? What's your ambition for the future? Do you see your company becoming international? Yeah. I, uh, I have big, big plans for Dawson Barker. I want to go global. Some of you may know Ryan Serhant, huge agent in the States. That's the sort of thing I'm going for. I want to you know, have 2,000 agents, lots of locations across the UK and worldwide. Um, but um, it, it takes time to get there. I always thought I could do it. You know, a couple of years, I'll be there. But the reality is, um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to begin with. It's not easy. This looks like a very linear journey. But in fact, it's been crazy up and down, up and down, up and down. I've nearly gone bankrupt a few times. I've made, like, I've been in the top 1% of earners in the world for my age. And then I've dropped right back down to calling my mum for 50 quid. You know, so it's like crazy the way it all goes. But um, eventually, I want to, yeah, take this on a, on a massive scale. Um, and that's what I enjoy. I was hugely inspired by a CEO um, that I worked with at Chesterton's, Guy Gittings. He's now the CEO of Foxton's, the big green agent. Um, and he is all about big energy, lots of people, big parties. We'd go on massive ski trips. We'd do huge events with like 500 agents in the same room. As you can imagine, it's, it's all good fun. And I'm about that energy because energy is what people are attracted to. Happy salespeople are good salespeople. And uh, when you have a good group of people, you can achieve good things. So I want more people. I want to grow the company. And uh, eventually it will happen. But it takes a lot longer than I thought it would. That's the only thing I would say. Yeah. How did you No, it's all mine. Uh, I got a uh, residential mortgage, so the uh, purchase price ended up being 330000 I put a 10% deposit down, that's 33 grand. Um, and I was very, I mean, I, I was obsessed, obsessed, obsessed with buying a property. When, all, all the way back here, when I started learning about property, I always wanted to buy one and to do it up, and I learned a lot along the way. But I, I worked hard, you know, I, I'd bill a million pounds for Chesterton's, and my commission was about uh, 10%. So on, on the million pounds, I'd make 100K plus the basic, plus other things that I was doing. I've always had like a side hustle on the go. Um, and eventually, I had enough to, to put the deposit down 33K. And then I had to work even harder and do more, more, more deals to be able to renovate the property. It then cost me about 80,000 to renovate the place, um, all in with uh, staging and other fees and agency fees. Um, so, it, again, it, when I actually bought the property and, and the builder sent me an invoice for about 25k for the first phase, I didn't have the money. Uh, I didn't have the money and um, there were a few properties at the time at Chesterton's that we had massive bonuses on. So some of the developers gave us properties to sell and if we sold it, they'd give us £15,000 bonus. And I focused my whole time on selling the, the development properties to get the bonuses so I could pay for the... Um, so I could pay for the refurb. And I had to be really nimble. Usually a property transaction could take six months, a long time. Um, but because I had an intricate understanding of the legal system of buying and selling properties, I was able to find a buyer for a flat on Labbrook Square. I remember t to this day, uh, she was actually the CEO of the White Company. She bought it from me, and we exchanged contracts in four days, which is like lightning fast. And I had 15 grand in my account the next week, and I sent it all to the builder. So... Again, I wasn't sat on a lot of cash. I couldn't call anyone. That doesn't, that's not a thing for me. Um, but I sort of put myself in a position where I fucking had to make it happen. And that really drove me. So same with you know, presenting to you guys today. I've never done this before. Um, the PowerPoint I made about 10 minutes before getting here. So it's the sort of, I, that's the way I operate. I put myself in uncomfortable positions. And it pushes me to, to sort of make it happen. And that's where the money came from, just being an agent. So you can make a lot of money. Uh, being an agent, but you've got to be good. Otherwise, you're stuck on 16 grand. If you're not doing deals, if you're not working hard, you're stuck on 16 grand. A lot of people, I'd say the average earnings for an agent in, in the UK is like 25 maybe to 40K, but the best agents make millions of pounds. And it's the top 1% of the agents that do 30% of the revenue in the industry. So you've got to be good. That's what I'd say. 
Uh, I don't finish ever, and I work every day. Yeah. Because my clients are all in different time zones all over the world. I'm getting calls at stupid times, getting messages at crazy times, and what people appreciate is, is speed. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't stop. As a corporate agent, you can stop. Um, you know, the working hours are usually 8.30 to 6, so a long day. Um, but then, you know, but then you sort of log off and, it, and it's all good. But I think to be a good agent, you've got to be on it. You've got to reply to people all the time. You've got to um, be available. So I make myself available. But I don't mind because I love the job. It's not um, that I'm waking up at, you know, 8.30 and going to clean something. I hate cleaning, for example. Uh, I'm, I'm going to walk around a £10 million, you know, townhouse in London and then going for some wine with a client and having a good time. So I love it, and I'm very lucky to love it, but if you don't love it, then it's probably, you know, it's tough because it's 24-7 in reality, to be honest with you. Yep. What's the marketing campaign for? Um, so we try and position ourselves as a, as a high-end brand to the market, so we've worked really hard on creating a, a certain perception around the business. The name, for example, Dawson Barker, um, my surname is Chmielewski. Yeah, can't use that for the business because guess what? Nobody understands it, nobody has to spell it. But I realised that all the top agencies in London are two posh names stuck together. Knight Frank, Stratton Parker, <laughs> Carter Jonas. So uh, Dawson Place is my favourite street in Notting Hill, so I took Dawson from there. And Barker, I typed into Google posh names and Barker was the first one that came up. And then I stuck <laughs> the two together. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's the perception that I try to create for the brand. You know, we're, we're a high-end, go-to real estate agency, um, and it's small things like that that make a big difference. Our website, for example, is far better than, than most agencies. Um, it, it's all bespoke. I spent tens of thousands of pounds on it, um, and we tend to only focus on properties um, in excess of four million pounds. If you list five properties all at five million pounds, it's likely that your sixth property and your seventh property that you list will also be at five million pounds. I could have very easily, when I started the business, taken on lots and lots of small flats to sell, 500k, 600k, you know, one million. But I just know that my next few clients after that would have been at the same price point. Stock breeds stock. That's something that I teach my team. Um, so if you're seen to be doing deals at five million, you're going to attract more deals at five million. Um, and that's just, um, that's just the way it works. So you've, it's really important that you get the perception right. But at the end of the day, it's all for Gazi for Gazi. You know, I told you, the name is whatever. Don't worry, it's my laptop. It's um, so, uh, yeah, you've, almost like a fake it till you make it type marketing strategy, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, so by the traditional path, you mean yeah, being like employed? Going ah, going to university. Uh, all the information you got, where to be uh, literate, and how that helped you. Yeah. What you mentioned. Yeah. Mm. I think uh, knowing my, I don't know if I can say it, but knowing my stuff um, has helped me get into the right rooms, get into, with the right people. So what you guys are doing is great because actually from an agency point of view, I can only talk to you from an agency point of view because that's what I do. Um, most people don't have a degree. Most people are a bit illiterate. You know, they don't really... It's not like a really um, sought-after industry from the outside's perspective. I don't know what you guys think of agents in general, but we're known to be dishonest and sleazy and don't make any money and all of that sort of stuff. But in reality, if, um, if you're well-educated, uh, like hopefully you will be and you have the knowledge to put yourself in, the right, in front of the right people, people then start to trust you as well. It's all about trust. So if you know what you're talking about, people start to trust you and you start doing more deals, that sort of thing. So I was a bit of a nerd when I was younger and I would sit for hours and hours and hours of watching pro uh, property videos, how to do this, how to do that, um, researching it. I got obsessed with, with property, and so I built up my knowledge that way. I could have gone to university and done it, but I just came across the right opportunity at the right time and, and jumped straight in instead. And actually, practical experience, uh, I think, is, is extremely important as an agent because I can talk to you and try to teach you about being an agent, but until you're out there and you're doing it and you're meeting the people, you're doing the deals, you're getting offers, you're negotiating... Um, it, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. So I'd say practical experience is extremely important. If you can get an internship, if you can 
um, go and speak with someone that, that's doing what you want to do, that's hugely valuable. But also having the technical knowledge. I, for example, was going to go and study finance. So when I talk to clients about macroeconomics, pound per square foot ratios, all of a sudden they're very, very, very impressed because as I said to you, most agents, 90% of them, don't know what they're talking about. So it makes a difference to stand out from an academic point of view as well, I would say. Does that answer your question? It was, it was uh, a bit... Yes. What else? You, yeah. yeah. Well, sorry, I was like, where do you get all the information from? Mm. Um, because you see face, oh, looking for universities and everything. I'm quite, I'm, I'm quite a nagger. I will um, nag people for information. When I started as an agent, uh, I would actually call the CEO of Chesterton's. I said to him, how have you got to where have you... How have you got to where you are? And I'd sit and I'd invite him for a coffee. And everyone's like, what are you doing? Like, what? what you don't call guy, don't call guy. What are you doing? Shush, shush. And everyone would tell me, shush, sit down, get on with your work. But I would talk to people. I love people and I love the whole social aspect of the job. And that's it. You, you can find things on Google. You can buy a course. You can do whatever you want. But actually asking someone that's done what you want to do, that's, that's the easiest and, and the best path of, of finding out the information with least resistance. Um, so that's what I would do, personally. I would talk to people, and I'd ask them for their time, and I'd be very polite, and I'd buy them the coffee, um, but then I'd extract information from them. So you've got to be quite outgoing. You've got to be not scared to, to pull someone aside and say, hey, really like what you're doing. I want to do it as well. And that's how I got the job as well. Yeah, I reached out to someone on LinkedIn, started bashing them with questions, um, and one thing led to another, and I got a job. Um, so people. People are the best resource for information in my industry, for sure. Yep. Are there any product-related events that you join to meet with potential customers or network with uh, other investors that you can partner up with? Yeah, so there's lots and lots of events. I mean, uh, from an agency point of view, once you're in the right circle, you, you start going to lots and lots of events and you get invited to lots of stuff. Um, from an outsider's point of view, I don't think I personally went to any um, specific events, but it's very simple. You just type something into Google and there are, there are lots of things out there. Um, and again, I only talk from a, from a property agent point of view. I haven't dabbled too much into finding investors for property development, although I know basic things about that. Um, but the, I would say it's a numbers game. The more people you see, the more opportunities you're likely to get. If you see 10 people, your chance of anything happening is probably 1%. If you see 100 people, probably 10%. So you increase your chances by seeing more people, speaking to more people, telling more people about what you want to do. And eventually someone will like you. And I'll say, okay, I'm coming with this guy. I'm going on this journey, or I'm investing my money here. Um, but it, it, yeah, just just see people, speak to as many as you can. That's what I would say. Yep. Uh, let me set back. I face. Oh God. Um, the, do you know what? There's been so many. I think one of the the the, the main ones was my my decision when I first started the business from day one to get an office for 20 grand a month and hire lots of people. People can be problematic as well. And I hired this guy. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a nightmare. Um, because I wanted to rush, I wanted to, to, to build this department, and I, I just rushed it. The first person I interviewed, I hired. Uh, I was like, great, yeah, in you come. And now we're, we're potentially going to go to court. You know, the guy's absolutely bonkers, and he's starting to, like, sue me for lots of things that didn't happen, saying I didn't pay him or whatever. And um, I think I did everything far too quickly, and that was my biggest setback, getting the big office, which I had to really get out of that to get my lawyers to like, scramble on the contract to, to get me out of that contract so I'm not stuck paying 20 grand a month. Um, and uh, doing things too quickly has landed me in hot water way too many times, putting guys like Lewis at risk, my business at risk, everything that I've built, all the money that I've made, could have gone very quickly because I rushed. So I've been in really tight spots because of um, spending too, money on, too much money on the office and also hiring that one guy, which is causing me a bit of grief at the moment. Yeah? You uh, showed us your timetable about how you stuck to your day and that in the morning you would do your cold calls and cold emails. Yeah. How, do you, who do, how do you know who to call and who to email? Where do you get that information from? Um, so we do a, a lot of data collection. I mean, there's... Um, uh, a strategy that I've sort of engineered in my own head for, for getting clients. Um, it's quite a systems-based <coughs> industry, so a lot of the cold approaches, for example, I'll see a, see a property that's on the market um, for sale. Um, I'll then find out the address, say it's 97 Eaton Terrace. I'll go to the land registry. On the land registry, I can find out who owns the property, the name and surname. 
I'll get the name and surname, put it into Google, put it into Rocket Reach, put it into LinkedIn, try and find their email or phone number that way, and then I'll email them. And I won't email them once, I'll email them 50 times until they reply, and I'll call them as well. So we do a lot of digging. We do, I've got a team that does the digging now for me, which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's actually really mind-numbing and boring doing that. Uh, but you have to do it because then at, after email 57, someone will reply and then we set up the meeting, go for a coffee, they instruct me to sell their property and I make 200 grand. So it is all worth it in the end, but it's very tedious. Um, so we do a lot of that and also past contacts. So say email 57 replied to me six months ago, but we didn't really get on. Uh, I might call them again six months later or email them again. So we do a lot of following up um, old contacts, old clients, people that I've sold to before, people that I've done business with before. Ultimately, there's so many people you could call. And if you don't have the database to begin with, you can find it, which is what I just described to you, getting the address and the land registry. Uh, or you start calling your network, people that you've worked with before. Perhaps they know someone that's going to sell something. Um, so there's always someone to call. But it takes a lot of time to build data. That was a new business at Chesterton's. I had 40,000 people to call every day if I wanted to. When I started Dawson Bark, I had maybe 15. You know, So it's, it takes a lot of time and money to build the data. It's not cheap. Um, so that's how we find it. I mean, I gave you one example of, of the journey of finding the data, but there's lots, ultimately. Yeah. Do you use the same process when you go for your off-market deals as well? Yeah, so I, for example, have a letter. I have a letter that I send out to some of the big houses in London saying, we have a buyer. I may have a buyer, I may not. Uh, but I send a letter saying, hi, I'm working with an American family that have flown into London for the next four weeks. They're particularly interested in your home. Please give me a call if you'd consider selling. And oftentimes, you will send like 1,000 letters and maybe three people will reply. Um, but when they do reply, again, it's another opportunity, another deal that I can do. So there's lots of like little diff different like industry secrets and tactics of, of doing it, but you've got to hook someone in. So if I say to them, I have a buyer for your house, they're going to think, ah, if he has someone that's particularly interested in my house, maybe they're going to pay a premium for it. And that's why they then call you and, and discuss it. I might, I might not have the buyer. Um, I might then have to say, ah, they've actually gone on holiday for the next two weeks, but let's meet and, uh, and let's talk about it. And one thing will lead to another, and then you'll, you'll get the deal. In that situation, then, how do you end up finding a buyer if the seller gives you that? Again, network. I'll pick the phone up to everyone I know that might have a buyer. So I work with a lot of uh, other agents as well. We collaborate, and I'll call all the agents. And I'll say, hey, man, I've just been let into 37 Eaton Place. Do you have someone for this? Um, and then some, most of the time they will, um, and, uh, and then we'll stick the dots together and make it happen. Or I'll advise them to go on the market, and sometimes we go on the market, and then obviously when you're on right, there's Uber on the market, anyone can call in and ask for it. But the off-market deals are all down to network as well. You've got to be friends with all the agents in your area um, to, uh, to sort of expand your reach. I might have 2,000 buyers, but actually John from Savills is going to have 400,000 buyers because he's a big agency. So if I'm friends with John from Savills, and I have a good property, I'm going to send it to John, and I'm going to offer him half my commission if he brings me a buyer for this property. And John's going to do it, because John loves me, and we're good friends. And so the more friends you have, uh, the better it is for you, especially on the off-market stuff. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, crazy. Um, you know, we're, we're, I'm negotiating personally on about six or seven deals live, one of them being Jonathan. Um, we're, going to, we're going to write the offer of six million and 50,000, but that's, that's half a million pounds below the asking price. And so I'm negotiating with, I think I can say this, I'm not under NDA. The, uh, uh, the, the guy that owned Harrods, Doddy, Fayed, or whatever, his dad, um, all of his siblings, they own the house. And uh, so I'm having to go into Mayfair, into their family office, and sit with the representative and, and hash it out, if that makes sense. It's very time consuming, but those people like to deal face to face for some reason. And they think they can intimidate me, but they can't. Um, and so, yeah, I'm out doing meetings all day, every day, speaking to people on the phone. It's hectic. Being an agent is crazy, so if you can't organise your time, you're screwed. And actually, I can't organise my time, but I'm lucky now to be able to hire people that organise my time for me. So, um, yeah, back to back every day, and you've, you've got to love it, really. You've got to be able to be on high energy all the time, um, but uh, it, it is busy. The market's really picking up. The market towards the end of last year was difficult because interest rates... Uh, were quite high relative to what they were, say, two years ago. Um, but now um, interest rates are slightly, well, starting to come down. Inflation has dropped. The Bank of England have held the base rate for the first time in a long time. And so because 
uh, interest rates are lower, it's then cheaper to get a mortgage, borrowing is, uh, is much cheaper as well, and then confidence comes back into the market because all of a sudden it's cheaper to buy, which means we have more buyers looking, and when there's more buyers looking, there's more viewings, there's more deals um, that happen as well. Yep? Do you know what, that's probably the most difficult question. It's the most difficult thing to figure out. I haven't figured it out yet. You know, I'm pretty unhealthy. I don't go to the gym, I eat burgers all the time. I'm, you know, it's not good. Um, but it's quite an addictive thing. You know, when you start doing lots of deals and you see the, the, the zeros adding up in the bank account, you sort of just keep doing it, you keep pushing it because it's making you money. But that is, it's very difficult to, to balance everything. Um, and I can't really answer your question because I don't know. I, I do I, I do burn out and then um, you know and then I'm sort of like in a bit of a slump for a bit and I wake back up um, but it's it's difficult man yeah I don't know to be honest with you I don't know hopefully I'll know in 10 years from now but yeah but yeah, just after this one when you're on your own business you're in charge actually you don't feel that this is a lot of work it's not something that because you control your schedule you control the meetings you have so how to do something you love. If you feel sounds of burnout, you could say yes, let's do a holiday, let's dedicate the bus to someone else's meeting. And you're only talking about your own time. All your role is just to make your things work to do. It is, but you are basically uh, <coughs> running that train and bus of cars. At any moment you could say I'm happy to sacrifice on the revenue on certain things uh, because I just need to take a two week break, for example. In the, in the early stages, it's like impossible for me because I'm, I'm building momentum, I'm building revenue, I'm building teams and structure. And I have a list of about 200 things in my inbox right now that I have to do. Um, so getting away is important, but I find it hard to switch off. I, just, I came back from Milan yesterday morning. I went for three days just to uh, go to some of the restaurants, eat some um, pasta and drink some wine with a friend of mine. And um, it was just, you know, I, I couldn't switch off. I, but I do enjoy three-day quick trips. And if I was in the corporate world, I couldn't do that because I'd, you know, have to submit a request. And it was like a spontaneous trip. So you, you're, you're absolutely right. You, I, I have the freedom to do whatever the hell I want to do. But I have to work hard for that freedom. It doesn't... Um, if I drop everything now for two weeks, yeah, week three is going to be difficult. Really, really difficult. So um, in the early stages, I'd say literally impossible if you're doing it right I think it's impossible to like not work all the time but then quite rightly you can start delegating building the team hiring people putting processes in place that take you away from the business and when the business is a well old machine it runs by itself almost you, then you can step in one day two days a week to inspire to motivate to, to measure KPIs and that's when it gets great but I haven't got to that stage yet so yeah All good. Okay, right. So Great. Did, did you do this session answer some of the questions? Because we talked about cash flow in your assessment. Do you remember that? Yes. So I think. Oh, please, go ahead. Please don't get it wrong. How old are you? Your age, please. 20. You can jump it on if you want. I knew it. Yeah, well. Yeah, but, you know, uh, I, I haven't done anything crazy yet. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. Okay, but factor in, factor in the timeline he showed you, it's when he started. And that's the reason why I asked about that, to, to just be quite authentic about the exact events in his life. About having experienced someone else and then starting his, his own business because he has the confidence, he has the connections, he knows you know, the key elements of that business. I have a quick question. Did you deal with banks? Because in real estate, it is a good thing to be in debt with the bank. Like lenders? Are we talking mostly lenders? Uh, it depends. So, I mean, some, some, uh, some people choose real estate investors or some choose the bank, to work with the bank. And, and usually these people, they have a high portfolio. Uh, we're talking about like maybe 250 million dollars Yep. 
Yeah, I think, I think leverage is a beautiful thing if you can get it right. Working with a bank to develop and flip properties comes usually after you've built some form of track record. A, a private investor is likely to have a higher risk tolerance, and so it's easy to get money for your first project from a private investor. You, only can, you can only really go to a bank once you have a track record or you have enough of a property portfolio to hedge um, that risk against the property portfolio. So a bank will never take on a first-timer, for example, that has no property portfolio, no track record. But once you've done a few private deals, for example, with a few investors, you can then pitch to the bank, hey, I've done this, these are my last three projects, and all of them have been successful, give me money for my fourth. Or, um, if you're very lucky, you have lots and lots of properties, and then they just secure the loan onto those properties and give you, pull money out of those properties to give you money to play with, if that makes sense. You've got to build good relationships with, with private investors to begin with if you don't have crazy, crazy rich parents or money just flying out of your ears um, because that's, they, they have a much higher risk tolerance. They'll believe in you as the individual and perhaps some of your experience, let's say, as an agent to give you the money to do it. Or you just smash it out as an agent, make the money yourself, start small, do a small flip and just build, 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 build and take your time. Um, but, yeah, leverage is everything, you know, because to borrow money at 5% from the bank is cheap, um, relatively speaking, you know, uh, if, especially if it, you, your money's tied in for a year. Um, so, yeah. Is that something you're interested in? Yep, yeah, long term. But at the moment, I'm building cash flow. I'm building the team. I'm building the business. So the business can pump money into my account, and then I can redistribute it into buying more properties and leverage it further. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I live in Not <coughs> Notting Hill. Our office is in Knightsbridge, so we're pretty central. We do deals all over central London. Um, but I'm yeah, or originally from Kent. And I was actually born in Poland, of all places. I'm not from here. English is my second language. Um, and, you know, parents came here as immigrants. Interesting sort of start to life, but then things got better. So that's my background. Yeah. Absolutely. That's how I started my career, selling you know, slightly cheaper properties. Well, cheaper. I mean, it's still extremely expensive. You know, 500k or a million pounds is a lot of money. Um, but uh, you know, the job really skews your brain. I now look at a million pound deal and I think, oh, not for me. But it, yeah, it's a lot of money. That's why I, I did lots and lots of deals. I've done probably 30 deals under a million, you know. Um, so definitely. And there's a lot of money to be made in that as well. And one million. Yeah, one million. Again, you're quite right. The cash flow, it's much quicker to sell, much easier to sell. When you're selling a 10 million pound house, it can take like a year, two years to sell it, whereas a million pound flat in the right market will sell in like a few days um, in London. So yeah, and the commission there is, is quite good as well. So yeah, definitely, yeah. I, 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 as I say, if I'm all about relationships. If my client that has a 50 million pound house then also has a property portfolio with lots of small investment flats, guess what, I'm gonna sell them for him because I like him, because I want to help him out. Um, and he'll do the same for me, if that makes sense. We'll sort of help each other out. Um, so just case by case, but from a perception point of view, from a marketing point of view, I want my company to be known as the super prime agency, you know, 5 million plus, 10 million plus, 20 million plus, because I'll attract more of that business. And then, yeah, in the background, I can do some more stuff. Yeah. Okay. All good? Amazing. No, thank you. Thank you.